there's no one else who loves me like you used to. Sometimes we're not ourselves, there's no one I can turn to.
Kami informasikan acara ini dilaksanakan secara daring dan luring dengan jumlah peserta secara daring sebesar 150 orang peserta. Hadirin kami mohon menempatkan diri karena acara akan segera kita mulai. Bagi hadirin yang mengikuti kegiatan ini secara daring, mohon mengaktifkan kamera dan menonaktifkan mikrofon. Terima kasih. Respected audience, we would like to invite you to be seated at the respective seats as we will start the event in a few minutes. For all audience who are participating online, please kindly turn on your camera feature and turn off your microphone. Thank you. Terima kasih dan selamat datang kami ucapkan kepada Dekan Fakultas Ekonomika dan Bisnis Universitas Diponegoro sekaligus Ketua Ikatan Sarjana Ekonomi Indonesia Cabang Semarang, Profesor Dr. Suhadjubo S.E.M.S.I. International Monetary Fund Senior Resident Representative untuk Indonesia selaku Pembicara Seminar Nasional, Mr. James Walsh, P.A. Ph.D. Pembahas Seminar Nasional, Ibu Esther Sri Astuti, S.A.M.S.A. Ph.D. Moderator Seminar Nasional, Dr. Dar Al-Fakara, S.A.M.S.C. Para Wakil Dekan di Lingkungan Fakultas Ekonomika dan Bisnis Universitas Diponegoro, Para Ketua Departemen, Ketua dan Sekretaris Program Studi di Lingkungan Fakultas Ekonomika dan Bisnis Universitas Diponegoro, Dosen dan seluruh Sivitas Akademika Fakultas Ekonomika dan Bisnis Universitas Diponegoro, Hadirin dan seluruh tamu undangan, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to the Excellency, Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Diponegoro, and Chairman of Indonesian Economic Bachelor Association Semarang, Professor Dr. Suharnomo MSI, International Monetary Fund Senior Resident Representative for Indonesia as today's National Seminar Speaker, Mr. James Walsh, PA, PhD. Today's National Seminar Discussion, Mrs. Esther Sri Astuti, PhD. National Seminar Moderator, Dr. Rer Alfa Farah, MSC. Vice Deans in the Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro. The Head of Department, the Head and Secretary of Study Program in the Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro. And lecturers, academicians of the Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro. Respected audience, ladies and gentlemen. Ungkapan puji dan syukur marilah senantiasa kita panjatkan kehadiran Tuhan Yang Maha Esa, karena atas limpahan berkah dan rahmatnya kita dapat berjumpa dalam keadaan sehat untuk menghadiri acara seminar nasional dengan judul The Role of Multilateral Institution in Economic Revival pada hari ini, Selasa, 17 Mei 2022 secara daring dan luring. Acara ini merupakan salah satu rangkaian acara menuju sidang pleno ke-22 Ikatan Sarjana Ekonomi Indonesia yang terselenggara berkat kerjasama antara Ikatan Sarjana Ekonomi Indonesia Semarang dan Fakultas Ekonomika dan Bisnis Universitas Diponegoro. First of all, let's praise our God who has been giving us some blessings happiness, healthy, and mercy, so we can all attend and participate in the national seminar entitled The Role of Multilateral Institutions in Economic Revival on Tuesday, the 17th of May, 2022. This event is rolled to the 22nd Plenary Session of Indonesian Economic Bachelor Association, which is organized by Indonesian Economic Bachelor Association Semarang and the Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Diponegoro. Hadirin yang kami muliakan untuk menambah semangat dan memperkuat jiwa nasionalisme kita kepada tanah air tercinta, mari kita nyanyikan bersama lagu kebangsaan Indonesia Raya. As the first agenda of today's event, let's stand together to sing national anthem Indonesia Raya. Hadirin kami mohon berdiri. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please stand up.
Hadirin kami silakan duduk kembali. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, you may now take your seat. Hadirin yang kami muliakan, selanjutnya adalah sambutan sekaligus pembukaan seminar nasional oleh Dekan Fakultas Ekonomika dan Bisnis Universitas Diponegoro. Beliau juga merupakan Ketua Ikatan Sarjana Ekonomi Indonesia, Cabang Semarang, Koordinator Jawa Tengah. Respected audience, it's our honor to have the Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Diponegoro and also as the Chairman of Indonesian Economic Bachelor Association Semarang to deliver a welcoming speech and afterward we would like to request the Dean to officially open today's national seminar. Kepada Profesor Dr. Suhart Nomo, SDNSI, dengan hormat kami, silakan. His Excellency Profesor Suhart Nomo, the time is yours. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang. Good afternoon. Our speaker, Mr. Tim Swartz, uh, from IMF representative for Indonesia. Terima kasih. Welcome to Semarang. This is your first time in Semarang? Okay. Mungkin Bu Alfa nanti will bring you go around. Kota lama lah setidaknya. <laughs> okay. Our discussion, Mbak Esta Sri Astuti, PhD. Mbak Dr. Rel Paul uh, Alfa Para, our moderator, Mas Bayu, terima kasih. And uh, our college is a Semarang chapter, board of Semarang chapter. Teman-teman is a vice dean of academic, vice dean of resources. Teman-teman dosen, academicians, our students, participants, warm greeting to all of us. It is my privilege to welcome you all to the National Seminar 2022 Road to Plenary Session this day that will be held on uh, 24 August uh, 2024. Jadi, for the first time, IC Semarang akan menyelenggarakan uh, pleno nanti uh, next August. Terima kasih, ini Mas Bayu yang arranged uh, this event happen in our field of faculty and thanks to Uh, Mr. Tim Walsh. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know that COVID-19 led to one of the most severe global recession in living memory. Undoubtedly, the Indonesian economy has been affected by the COVID-19 for the last two years. This pandemic has caused a decline in various economic sectors as the consequences for social limitation. This condition makes us wonder how can we restore our economic condition. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia's current economy is very, very dependent on the government's response to the pandemic. Back to 2020, our economic growth was negative and only started to recover in 2021. Alhamdulillah, in the first quarter of 2022, Indonesia's economy was growing 5.01, recovering well because of the government's excellent fiscal and monetary coordination. This is known that by the decline of stimulus fund that the government needs to deliver, fewer social limitations, uh, as we know as a PPKM, and a successful vaccination campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of our faculty, I'm very uh, grateful that in this pandemic situation, we can still conduct a seminar hybrid with limit limited set sit in uh, our campus, FAB Tembala, and also online. May we have a fruitful discussion, and may we all gain new and valuable knowledge through this seminar. The, the cutting-edge knowledge about 
the global economic trend and challenges that will be brought by Mr. Tim Walsh to ESA and to Alpha Farah. Once again, thank you very much to IMF, Mr. Walsh, Mas Bayou, uh, thanks to our audience. Thank you very much for your participation. Please enjoy the conference. Finally, by saying syukur alhamdulillah in the name of God, the Almighty, I declare the National Seminar Road to ISA Plenary Session officially open. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hadirin yang kami muliakan, tibalah kita pada inti acara, yaitu penyampaian materi seminar nasional dengan judul The Role of Multilateral Institution in Economic Revival, dilanjutkan dengan diskusi dan tanya jawab. Sesi ini akan dipandu oleh moderator, yaitu Dr. Rer Alfa Farah S.A.M.S.C. Beliau adalah dosen Fakultas Ekonomika dan Bisnis Universitas Diponegoro sejak tahun 2009. Beliau memperoleh gelar Sarjana Ekonomi dari Universitas Diponegoro, gelar Master Ilmu Ekonomi dari Universitas Groningen Belanda, dan gelar Doktor Ilmu Ekonomi dari Universitas Münster Jerman. Respected audience, now we have come to the main part, which is the national seminar entitled The Role of Multilateral Institution in Economic Revival, followed by discussion session and also question and answer session. This session will be moderated by Dr. Rel Alfa Farah MSC. She is a lecturer at the Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Diponegoro since 2009. She holds a bachelor's degree from Universitas Diponegoro, a master's degree in economics from the University of Groningen, the Netherlands, and doctorate in economics from the University of Munster, Germany. Kepada Ibu Dr. Rel Alfa Farah SAMSC, kami silakan untuk memandu sesi ini. Without further ado, we invite Dr. Rer Alfavara MSC to guide the session. Hello. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon as well for those of you who are joining us today online. It is a great, a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Mr. James Walsh, who is going to talk to us about global economic trends and challenges. This is a topic that we are deeply interested in. After being hit by the pandemic, uh, the war in Ukraine posed uh, challenges to the, global, to the global economic recovery. We are especially interested to have some insight about how Indonesia might, might respond to these challenges. Uh, uh, Mr. James Walls has been working at the IMF for over 16 years, especially in Asia, such as in China and in India, and he is currently the representative, senior representative of IMF at Indonesia. So we are very delighted to have you here, sir. Uh, in addition to Mr. James Walsh, we also have Mrs. Esther Augustine, who's going to talk about Indonesian economy today and its prospect. Um, Mrs. Augustine is a lecturer at the Faculty of Economics, Diponogoro University, and is currently a program director at IMF. I uh, know, so at INDEF. Sorry for a mistake. And uh, she obtained her bachelor degree at this university and completed his uh, PhD degree from Maastricht University in the Netherlands. So please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Mrs. J uh, Mr. James Walsh and Mrs. Augustine onto the stage. Please.
So uh, thank you, Mr. James Walls and also Mrs. Augustine for joining me in the stage. So what we're going to do today is uh, there will be a presentation by you for about 30 to 45 minutes regarding the uh, global challenges and trends, and then followed by a presentation by Mrs. Augustine regarding the Indonesian current economic uh, situations. And then this, this, uh, this uh, seminar will be closed by questions and answer sessions. So uh, the state is yours. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, as the Dean said before, this is my first time in Semarang. Uh, today is actually the one year anniversary of when I arrived in Indonesia to take this job. So for me, it's a very auspicious day to be in Semarang. And I appreciate very much the opportunity to talk to everyone about the global economy and Indonesia's role in the global economy. So. Um, I will talk for a little while, uh, probably too fast and probably too long, uh, and then I'm uh, happy to answer any questions that anyone has, and I also look forward to uh, the discussion uh, with Bueste. Uh, so if we could bring up the presentation, please. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, what's been going on, and maybe to the next slide, please, I think that's the... So I'll talk first about the IMF and what the IMF's role is in the global economy and our involvement with Indonesia, and then what is the current position of the global economy and how Indonesia fits into it. And uh, yeah, I've already well, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what the challenges are for Indonesia, uh, both coming out of the pandemic and also in the long run. So talk first about um, the IMF in Indonesia. The IMF and the World Bank were founded in 1944 uh, as an attempt to try to create a system for managing the global economy that would encourage economic stability around the world. So the IMF was designed to help countries maintain stable exchange rates over time, and the World Bank was set up to help Europe rebuild after the war. Uh, our relations, are, we do that the IMF's role uh, is primarily in three main areas. Uh, the first one is policy advice. So we write papers on global economic issues, uh, such as the World Economic Outlook, which comes out twice a year. And we also provide policy advice to individual countries. So for example, with Indonesia, uh, once a year, we publish what's called an Article 4 report, where we have a team from Washington that meets with people in Indonesia in the private sector, the government, central bank, uh, to talk about economic developments and make advice on economic policies. Uh, that is then discussed by our board uh, back in Washington, and the board uh, endorses this advice or provide, you know, gives the, official, the IMF's official view on economic policies. And we do this for all of our, uh, all of our members, so from you know, the, the smallest countries in the fund. I'm not sure I need the mic, but... Uh, from the smallest countries in the fund all the way to China and the United States. The second area where the fund works is on lending policy. So countries that um, uh, are currently in balance of payments difficulties will borrow from the IMF. So at the moment, because of COVID, we are lending to an unusual number of countries, uh, quite a few new programs that have been set up since the pandemic. Uh, Indonesia is not one of those countries. I don't expect that it will be anytime soon, but it's something that uh, has become available and that the, the fund is trying to, over time, we've tried to change how we engage in these kinds of lending operations to be, to work more closely with countries and recognize that every country's conditions are different and try to make sure that we can uh, return countries or work with countries to return them to balance of payment stability without undue problems. And the third area is capacity development, where we work with public agencies to help develop their own capacity for implementing economic policies. 
So some examples of that would be on uh, bank supervision or on tax collection or on calculating inflation. So uh, we don't work so much with Indonesia on lending, but in the other two areas, policy advice and capacity development, we do work quite closely with Indonesia. So next slide, please. Uh, the fund also has what we refer to as the new areas of work. Uh, the, some of these are areas that are crucial to how economies develop, but not necessarily something that traditional macroeconomists have looked at. So one of those is inequality. Uh, we want to make sure that as countries grow, that that growth includes everybody and that it's inclusive and it's not all just accruing to the wealthiest members of society and also that economic policies are undertaken in a way that benefits everybody rather than just the wealthy. Uh, in a similar vein, we, we are trying to mainstream gender in our work these days where we focus on the implications on men and women of different economic policies and try to make sure that uh, to the extent that some policies, such as pensions, for example, might affect men and women in different ways, that we are aware of that and policies are designed to be inclusive and aware of those issues. And the third and largest one is climate change. Uh, this is going to be a huge challenge for everyone, and it's the one that I'll be talking about later in my presentation. Uh, this is a huge challenge for economic policy makers and for regular individuals as well. Um, we can see all over the world that storms have become more severe and that there's more flooding than there used to be. And in the U.S., we have more forest fires than we used to. It's a, it's a global challenge that will require an unusual degree of cooperation and uh, a very long list of policies to get to where we would need to be on that. So next, please. So as I said, the IMF has had a close relationship with Indonesia for a long time. Uh, my office, the Resident Representative Office in Jakarta, opened in 1964. I think this is the oldest Resident Representative Office in the IMF. Uh, I'm going to say it is until someone tells me I can't anymore. And as I said, every year we publish a report uh, on the Indonesian economy called the Article 4 Report. The most recent one was published in March. Uh, it's freely available on our website. Uh, I will be summarizing some of the recommendations from that report. Uh, along with discussing some other issues as well. But what I would say about this is it really has been a very, Indonesia is an important member of the fund. And in a lot of ways, it's a country that many people in the IMF are aware of. Uh, it has, I'll come back to this later, but uh, Indonesia's approach, for example, toward monetary policy and capital controls and integrating macro-credential policy into the work of the central bank has really been one of the leading, it's really been one of the leading countries in that area. And the IMF has been one way for, uh, the, for Bank Indonesia to see that the rest of the world learns from BI's policies and its, uh, its way of doing things. And I can say that it's something that is discussed within the fund and how Indonesia undertakes its policies is really something that IMF staff are aware of. So uh, it is a close relationship and it's one where we benefit and I hope that Indonesia benefits as well. So next, please. So next, I'll talk a little bit about the global economy. Um, as, as it was said in the introduction, the pandemic led to a very severe economic contraction, uh, by some measures the worst thing we've seen since the Great Depression. Uh, one key difference in how the world is coming out of the pandemic has been that a lot of the advanced economies were able to provide very large stimulus programs to support their economies during the pandemic while a lot of emerging markets didn't spend quite as much money. So what we see as a result of that is that many of the advanced economies, their economic output, GDP, is close to or even beyond where we would have expected it to be back in 2019. They very strongly supported their economies and pushed them uh, back toward uh, their maximum capacity. There was much less of this that was available in the emerging markets. And as was also very clear over the course of last year, the advanced economies, uh, for various reasons, were able to vaccinate their populations much faster than a lot of emerging markets were. And that also encouraged people to go back to work, to go back to shopping uh, faster in Europe and North America than in, for example, Latin America or Southeast Asia. So what we see is that the recovery has been a little bit faster in the advanced economies than it has been in a lot of emerging markets. 
And um, that's important for a, a few reasons, but uh, maybe we'll do the next slide first. Uh, okay. So another, another factor behind this issue with uh, the differential recovery between the advanced economies and the emerging markets has been the, the war in Ukraine, obviously. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of the Ukraine situation and its effect on the global economy a little later. But it is important to recognize that the global economy already had some conflicts that were going on, uh, such as this much more rapid growth and much more tight labor markets in advanced economies than in emerging markets. And the, the tension caused by the war, as well as the reduction in confidence and higher commodity prices have intensified those. So, as I said, though, uh, a lot of emerging markets have grown a little more slowly than uh, the advanced economies have, or at least the recovery has been slower. So one concern that we have about this is that we expect uh, some scarring in economies, which, which is to say that growth may never catch up in some economies to where it would have been without the pandemic. So what this means is that, uh, you know, if we had expected incomes to rise at a particular level back in 2018, now we, we think it'll take a few more years to get to that level. And there's quite a few areas where you can see this kind of scarring and what it means in the real world. So <clears throat> one of them I would point out is uh, a lot of companies are very indebted after the pandemic. They had to borrow money to survive throughout a period when they had very few clients. So now they have higher debt burdens. Uh, another issue is that a lot of people who have been work who were out of work during the pandemic, their skills have probably deteriorated somewhat. So many of those workers will now be less productive. And third, and I think the most important one from the long run point of view, is that schools were closed in many countries for a very long time. And we will have a lot of kids who uh, either have not gotten the education that they would have gotten if they had been in school, or they will leave entirely and not come back. Uh, this long-term scarring from kids leaving education, I, I expect will be the major legacy of the pandemic in a lot of ways. And that's something that, so far, it seems disproportionately affects girls around the world. And it's unfortunate as we try to make sure that women are provided the same opportunities in the labor market as men. This uh, differential impact from schools is a real problem. Uh, so next, please. So uh, as, I, as I said before, the advanced economies recovered a little earlier than the emerging markets. So in most of the advanced economies, inflation was already rising before the war started in Ukraine. Uh, now, uh, we've revised up inflation almost everywhere. Uh, part of this is because of uh, the ongoing difficulties around the world with supply issues, which are slowly being resolved but are still there. But the main reason is because, as is clear here and in other countries, commodity prices have been rising, and in particular fuel prices as a result of the situation in Ukraine. So we have revised up our forecast for inflation in most countries. Uh, Indonesia is a bit of an exception here. Uh, in inflation has been relatively low here throughout the pandemic, and it has been very slow to recover to normal levels that we see. Uh, a lot of other emerging markets have already experienced much higher inflation and already had to tighten monetary policy. Indonesia hasn't done that yet, and inflation here remains in the middle of the BI's target band. So I'll come back to that a little bit later, but uh, what I would say is that we are quite concerned about inflation around the world, and that outlook has gotten worse uh, as a result of the war in Ukraine. So next, please. So talking about Asia in, in general, while um, China is the biggest economy in the region, uh, managed to grow very strongly throughout the pandemic. So because they were very good at controlling the virus at an early stage, things were quite normal in China back in 2020 and 2021. Uh, so growth has actually been quite strong there throughout the pandemic. Now the situation has changed. The Omicron variant is much more contagious and harder for the authorities to control. So growth in China uh, this year has been a little weak, but overall it's been a pretty strong performance overall. And a lot of other Asian countries have actually had quite strong growth over the last year or so. India had a very strong contraction in 2020, but then has really been booming uh, last year and this year as well. So overall, Asia, Asia's growth has been pretty good uh, over the last year, and we expect it to still be uh, quite a strong year for most of the economies in the region. 
Next, please. Uh, but we are concerned that because of the situation in Ukraine, that uh, growth could the growth could slow down and inflation could rise. So, in these charts, these show how our growth forecasts have changed and how our inflation forecast has changed as a result of the situation in Ukraine. So, we are expecting a slightly less uh, strong recovery in Asia than we were a few months ago. And even though the, the war is quite far away and there's not the same direct linkages to Asian economies that we would see in Russia or in Western Europe, uh, there is some impact here from slowing growth in the European economy and from higher commodity prices. So the main thing will be higher inflation, as, uh, as you can see there. Uh, so next, please. So uh, again, just to underscore that since the emerging, since the advanced economies had begun recovering well before the war in Ukraine began, uh, that meant that interest rates had already begun to rise and the cost of borrowing had begun to rise in the U.S. and in a lot of other advanced economies. So we do see that financial conditions have tightened quite a lot across most of the advanced economies. And it's unfortunate because with the emerging markets recovering more slowly, and happening at a time when the situation in Ukraine is further dragging on their economies. We see this spillover effect from uh, very tight labor markets and rising interest rates in the advanced world spilling over into the emerging markets where labor markets are not quite so tight yet and where we still need more credit flowing to support recovery. So there, this is a, an unfortunate spillover effect from the advanced economies and in particular the U.S. So next, please. So as, as I said, these higher U.S. interest rates do spill over into Asia. It's a little hard for me to see the slide here. But um, the concern we would have here is that as, uh, as U.S. rates rise, uh, we wouldn't expect normally Asian rates to rise uh, one, one to one with, for, with American rates. But there will be capital flow issues where uh, capital will if, if, if Indonesian rates are unchanged, then capital will leave Indonesia and move into the advanced economies, and especially the U.S. And we have seen some evidence of that. I think it's very clear in Japan, for example, that the very wide differential between U.S. and Japanese interest rates has led to a lot of capital outflows from Japan. And the yen is now weaker than it's been in uh, quite a long time. And this kind of spillover effect from tighter U.S. monetary policy and higher U.S. inflation will become more of a problem over time. Next, please. So next, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Indonesia in the global economy. Uh, first thing is Indonesia's trade relations with the rest of the world. Uh, Indonesia's biggest trading partner is China. About a quarter of trade here is with China. And uh, a quarter of, the tra of international trade is also with other countries in ASEAN. So Indonesia is even though it might not be as tightly tied into a lot of global supply chains as some other economies in the region are, uh, most trade is with countries in the region. If you include Japan and Korea, it's well over half of Indonesia's foreign trade is with countries in Southeast Asia and North Asia. So it's, this is a, an economy that's very well integrated into the region. Uh, the U.S. is the third biggest trading partner, but again, has less than half the amount of trade with the U.S. that Indonesia has with China. So when we think about how Indonesia fits into the global economy, it's quite tied into the uh, local Asian economy more than, uh, more than a lot of other countries could be. So next, please. Uh, and then Indone on the financial markets side, uh, Indonesia is quite tied into global financial markets, especially in bond markets. So this is uh, something I'll come back to later. but. Before the pandemic, Indonesia had an unusually high amount of its government debt that was held by foreign investors, and this was widely seen as a major vulnerability for the Indonesian financial system. Uh, back in 2013, when the Fed announced that it would begin to reduce its purchases of securities, and there was a period of volatility in the financial markets that we started calling the taper tantrum, uh, Indonesia was very dramatically affected and there were large-scale sales by foreign investors of Indonesian debt. Uh, that share of foreign holdings of Indonesian debt has fallen quite a bit over the course of the pandemic, and now it's, I think, 17%. So this is a real reduction in vulnerabilities. Uh, on the other hand, it's surprising that uh, foreigners have reduced their holdings of debt because Indonesian 
spreads are not particularly high by global standards, but they are, you know, they, they are, Indonesian bonds pay much, much higher rates of return than U.S. bonds do. So something of an interesting question is um, if you look at the borrowing rate of the United States and then you add in how much it costs to insure against Indonesian default, which you can do through credit default swaps, there's a few percentage points of additional return that foreign investors get on Indonesian debt. And that is not high by the standards of most emerging markets, but it's higher than some of them. So that kind of spread in China is zero or negative. There's no real compensation that investors are given for exchange rate risk or for macroeconomic or political risk. But in Indonesia, it's, it's relatively high, though, again, not as high as in Brazil or Russia. Uh, and I would also say that throughout the pandemic, uh, inflows into Indonesia have been quite stable, and the rupiah has been quite stable. That's also a bit of a puzzle. It's a little surprising that during the Delta variant last year, uh, investors were sufficiently confident in the Indonesian economy that we didn't see very much volatility in the rupiah or in capital flows. And then as the Omicron variant went through, maybe you could say that we knew that the economy would perform very well. But even as the war in Ukraine started and commodity prices rose, there really wasn't much of an increase in the exchange rate. So that's a bit of a puzzle, too. So next slide, please. So I'll just to talk about some of the effects of the war in Ukraine on, on the Indonesian economy and financial system. Uh, the main effect that we see from the war in Ukraine has been commodity prices. I think this has been pretty clear in Indonesia, as it is in most of the world. Um, with this global increase in food prices and in fuel prices, originally just because we saw an increase in pr the price of wheat and an increase in the price of oil, but that has flowed through to other commodities that are substitutes for wheat and oil, like natural gas and uh, rice. So we have seen pretty big increases everywhere. So for Indonesia, this is good and bad. Uh, on the bad side, uh, gasoline prices, and cartolite prices in particular, are kept well below market levels, and the government makes up the difference in subsidies. Uh, because of that, these subsidies will become much more expensive this year than they've been in the past. So that it worsens the government's budget deficit, and it's also not good for the current account. But on the other side, uh, Indonesia exports palm oil, which, as we all see in the news, uh, is very expensive now, and coal, which has also gone up as a result of the war in Ukraine. So those uh, products, because the government receives tax revenue from them and because Indonesia is a net exporter, those support the current account and the uh, fiscal account. So the overall, ex overall, we expect Indonesia to benefit in, this, in these strict senses, uh, the fiscal deficit and the um, current account from the situation in Ukraine just because of this effect of higher commodity prices. Uh, so next, please. Uh, unfortunately, that as we can also see from uh, the discussions about palm oil in Indonesia, these prices feed into inflation around the world. So this is a bit more muted in Indonesia than it is in a lot of other countries because uh, electricity prices and gasoline and LPG are administered by the government. And the question of to what extent higher global prices for oil and natural gas impact Indonesian inflation is a policy question as much as an economic one. In a lot of other countries where there aren't such subsidies, so I have Thailand, for example, the Philippines, Brazil, Russia, those prices have already gone through and increased inflation. But in Indonesia, that hasn't yet fully uh, happened. But certainly, the increase in food will affect Indonesia. Uh, palm oil already is. We may see a similar effect in, um, in wheat. Uh, so the second effect, uh, while higher commodity prices will make it easier for the government to reduce its budget deficit, it does make it harder for the central bank to keep inflation down. And we'll see what happens with inflation over the next few months. So next, please. Uh, and the third issue, and the one that's most abstract and difficult to forecast, is how the conflict in Ukraine will affect our risk appetite and global conditions. I think a, a few months ago, this was a big open question. We didn't really know how investors were going to react to the situation in Ukraine. But now it really seems as if a lot of global investors are less concerned about the situation in Ukraine, which is kind of understood and people have sort of priced it into markets. And they're more concerned about the Fed's policies in the US and how long American inflation will stay high. 
and also how long the Chinese will be able to move from lockdown to lockdown and control the Omicron variant. But these global conditions and general attitude that foreign investors have toward risk, those will have a big impact on the Indonesian economy and financial system. So part of this is Ukraine, but there's also these other global factors, especially from the U.S. and China, that are affecting the outlook for Indonesia. So next, please. So I'll talk a little bit about how Indonesia responded to the pandemic. So now that we're coming out of the pandemic, I think it was pretty clear throughout the Omicron outbreak in Indonesia that nothing needed to be, we didn't really need to lock down as much as we had during the Delta variant. Uh, vaccination was much more widespread. A lot of people had already had the virus. There, it, the economy was really able to function much better during the Omicron wave than it had been during the Delta wave. So what we saw was pretty strong growth in the first quarter of this year, uh, 5%. And uh, we can see evidence of that in retail sales and in uh, just the, the amount of credit that the banks were able to provide to the economy. So. Uh, we are coming out of the pandemic now in Indonesia, and we uh, growth should be relatively strong this year. Uh, the IMF is a little more optimistic than the central bank and the finance ministry at the moment about growth this year, which is unusual because usually we are supposed to be more pessimistic, but this year we're more optimistic. Um, so we think growth this year will be about 5.4 percent, and it's a, the BI and the ministry have slightly lower forecasts. But it's true, growth is definitely coming back now. Next, please. Uh, we see this particularly with consumption. So uh, one indicator that we look at for consumption are things like vehicle sales and motorcycle sales, because as people become more confident about their employment prospects, they'll buy new vehicles. So there was a big spike in vehicle sales in the middle of the pandemic when a number of financial measures were undertaken to encourage the sales of vehicles. But now growth has returned, and it's been pretty strong for a while. So this is an indicator that uh, consumption is, is returning strongly in Indonesia. Next, please. Uh, and then on the external side, uh, because the Chinese economy and a lot of advanced economies have recovered relatively strongly, that has really supported Indonesian exports. Uh, this was clear even during the Delta variant uh, wave in Indonesia that manufactured exports remained quite strong throughout the whole time, and they remained strong through then, too. Uh, at the same time, the external position has also been strengthened by the fact that the slow, the, the fact that the recovery in Indonesia was later, it meant that imports here recovered more slowly than exports did. So that allowed the central bank to build up uh, more reserves over the course of the pandemic than, um, than it had before. Uh, as the economy now recovers and imports recover and strengthen, that means that the, that position is weakening a little bit, but it's still quite strong. and. Uh, High commodity prices certainly help, so the overall external position is pretty good in Indonesia right now. Uh, next, please. Uh, so it's hard for me to see this because it's so far away and this one's small. Uh, so yes, this is the economic recovery program. You know, when the, when, when the pandemic got underway, the fund worked with a lot of countries on how to design programs to support the economy throughout the pandemic. And the main areas where we encouraged governments to spend money were on, obviously, health care to make sure that people have access to testing and treatment and later on to vaccines, but also making sure that uh, low-income households were protected and the unemployed were protected and uh, small businesses were able to continue to operate throughout the pandemic. So one thing I would say about Indonesia's response was that it was very much along those lines. Uh, not, no, no program is perfect, and Indonesia did a, no, no program is going to be able to help everybody who needs help. But in Indonesia, the programs that were set up under the, uh, the program uh, Pemulihan Ekonomi Nasional were quite effective in supporting low-income households. They were very, at least from our point of view, they seemed quite well targeted and able to help a lot of low-income households and small businesses. Uh, so this is a, that's a good result of the program. Uh, my understanding is that while poverty rose by a few percentage points of the population at the beginning of the pandemic, it actually began to decline uh, in 2021, and it's expected to fall further in 2022. So perhaps continuing these programs is a good idea. Uh, so it, it, to the extent that they're able to reduce poverty and really help people, 
uh, it seems like there is a worthwhile idea to discuss in keeping some of these. Uh, next, please. Uh, at the same time, uh, all over the world, deficits rose during the pandemic. So these additional social programs, additional support for health care, they did widen the deficit. Uh, and on the other side, also tax revenues tend to fall during recessions and difficult times. So uh, the deficit did widen. Uh, the finance ministry plans to get back to the 3% budget deficit ceiling next year. We think it's quite likely that they will get there. Uh, even six months ago, I would have thought it was a pretty, they were on the path to getting to 3% by next year. But I will point out that the tax reform that was passed, the tax harmonization law, that will make it easier to get back to um, the 3% ceiling next year. And then also, the uh, now the higher commodity prices will also help. So even though there will be more money spent on fuel subsidies, there will be less money, uh, more money coming in from uh, palm oil and other commodity imports. So uh, the, the fiscal consolidation is underway. Indonesia is returning to normal here and returning toward a, a position where the, the fiscal is not facing unusual demands on the rest of the economy. Uh, so next, please. Uh, the other area is monetary policy. Uh, the policy rate right now is at what I believe is a record low, 3.5%. And uh, the, the Bank of Indonesia has been very active in supporting liquidity in the financial system. So they have begun to reverse that and try to move toward um, a normal level of monetary policy. Uh, as inflation rises, you may need to move past normal towards something that tightens to uh, bring down inflation. But the first step was announcing these increases in the reserve requirement. And this will begin to reduce surplus liquidity in the financial system and lay the groundwork for uh, eventual monetary policy tightening. So again, uh, the policy of normalization is underway here. Next, please. Uh, and then the, the third area where I would discuss normalization is the OJK has had a very wide-ranging program for encouraging the restructuring of loans to companies that are having financial difficulties but are still solvent. So at the peak of the crisis, about a fifth of banks' loan portfolios, or maybe up to a quarter, were restructured in this way. The borrowers had gone to the bank and said, we can't make payments right now, but we will be able to make payments later, and the banks extend the payments. Uh, that The stock of those restructured loans has been falling, and uh, we would expect that when this guidance on restructuring expires, which will happen in March 23, then uh, this shouldn't really have much of an impact on the financial system. The banks are, have quite a strong capital position, and the economy is recovering, the sales are recovering. So. This was an area where uh, other countries did not do such a great job of targeting a lot of this assistance toward companies. And in Indonesia's case, it, sound, it seems like the OJK uh, did a good job of making sure that the banks were restructuring loans to companies that would be able to pay them back. Uh, we'll see next year, but what this should mean is that the financial system will have come through the pandemic in a position where it's still able to support our recovery. So, next, please. Another issue where we need to move toward normalization is how the budget deficit is financed. So earlier on, I noted that the amount of Indonesian government debt that's held by foreign investors has really fallen over the last two years. And the main buyer of Indonesian government debt in that time has been the central bank. So in a lot of countries, this has happened. Uh, the Bank of Japan has been doing this for 20 years. The Fed and the Bank of England and the European Central Bank have been doing it for more than 10 years. The concern has always been that if banks engage in large-scale purchases of government debt, that this will begin to conflict with their policy, with their uh, mandate to keep inflation down. And in Indonesia, the agreement between the Central Bank and the Finance Ministry uh, was originally uh, agreed two years ago, but it's been extended twice, most recently in September of last year. So this new agreement is supposed to expire at the end of the year. And uh, at that point, it would really make sense for all of these auctions to move back to the private sector and have the central bank out of uh, buying bonds in the primary market. It's not that it has, it's been a good policy for an emergency situation, but we're no longer in an emergency situation. And there's always the risk that uh, this could lead to uh, uncertainty about inflation and potentially issues with the exchange rate. So it's important that these 
primary market purchases are phased out along the calendar that the ministry and the central bank have agreed on. Next, please. Uh, so then just to talk about some priorities going forward. Uh, next. So climate change, as I said, is an area that the fund is very concerned about. Uh, at COP26, the UN summit that was held in Scotland last year, uh, all countries around the world made commitments about how to how to reduce their emissions and how to uh, invest more in renewable energy and try to keep the global increase in temperatures down. Uh, as far as I know, no one is on track to do any of this. Uh, and that just means that you know, people born today or born in 10 years will have lower crop yields and le uh, more unpredictable rain, more difficulty with a lot of endemic diseases. Uh, it's, it's a difficult issue that no one has yet figured out an easy way out of. but. There are a lot of policies that governments around the world should be undertaking, and uh, Indonesia, as part of its international commitments, is one of the countries that should be working in this area. So, uh, next, please. So, the one that I would talk about, and the way that the fund is focused in thinking about this, is on trying to set up uh, carbon taxes around the world that will discourage the use of coal and fossil fuels and encourage the use of more renewable energy. Uh, Indonesia has very large reserves of geothermal energy, which is very fortunate. Most countries don't have those kind of uh, constant, you know, the one problem with renewable energy in most of the world is that it comes from wind and sun. So when it's cloudy or when it's night or when the wind stops blowing, you don't generate any renewable energy. But Indonesia has vast geothermal resources, and geothermal is there all the time. So it's, it's a, real, a real advantage for Indonesia that the country could take advantage of. But at the moment, the system is very heavily biased toward fossil fuels. So the maps on the left show to what extent uh, fossil fuels are underpriced relative to how the IMF thinks they should be priced to try to keep emissions down to a level that will reduce global warming. So Indonesia isn't the worst uh, violator on the list. But what is noticeable is the dependence on coal here and the fact that coal is very heavily subsidized. So the transition from coal to geothermal and solar and wind is complicated and it's expensive. And uh, there's a whole lot of policies that have to be brought about for that to happen. And they are, uh, they are quite challenging. I don't mean to minimize it. Uh, the government has made a commitment to have a quarter of energy from renewable sources in the next few years. But that will be very difficult to meet, especially when uh, coal is already not only supplying so much of Indonesia's energy needs, but it's heavily subsidized, and there's long-term coal tracks, contracts that are signed. So this move toward renewable energy is absolutely important, but it's going to be quite a challenge in Indonesia. And then next, please. Uh, a real concern about the whole carbon transition is that we talk a lot about the need to raise the price of uh, coal and raise the price of gasoline and natural gas. And a lot of low-income households rely on those fuels and not even just low-income households, everybody uses LPG for cooking <clears throat> in a lot of countries. So another area where we are trying to work with countries is how to develop programs that will help low-income households uh, go through this energy transition in a way that doesn't unduly force the burden onto them. Uh, Indonesia was able to do quite a bit of targeted income support for households through the uh, pandemic. And that's still ongoing with uh, my understanding is that they've been able to do this also with palm oil uh, subsidies. So the mechanism is there for helping low-income households. It can be improved in any country. There's, these databases are never perfect. But the mechanism is there to help low-income households through the pandemic. And that would be something ending energy subsidies and, and broadening Indonesia's carbon tax would be a way to begin to uh, curb emissions and control them and we can help protect low-income households throughout that process. Uh, so next, please. So just the three things I would say a key messages from this would be that Indonesia's economy is already recovering, but uh, in the long run, we'll need to keep inflation down. And as I said, inflation is rising in the rest of the world. It's beginning to rise now in Indonesia, but it will it will eventually catch up to the rest of the world. We, we, it's an open economy, and these price increases will affect here, too. So being vigilant about inflation will be important. And at the same time, we need to keep Indonesia attractive for investment, which it, it has, has been very successful over the last few years, and we need to continue that. Uh, second, the war of Ukraine in Ukraine 
uh, means that commodity prices are, are higher, which is good for Indonesia's current account and perhaps for the fiscal, but it has weighed down on global growth now, especially in Europe and Russia. So we need to be aware of the potential risks there. And then third, climate change. This is, a, as I said, a very difficult challenge. And uh, it's important that people all over the world, including at universities everywhere, are thinking about creative solutions to dealing with this. So I think that's my last slide. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, James, for your presentation. Specifically, you start with what IMF working areas in Indonesia, and then you follow with the global challenges um, after the pandemic, as well as the challenges faced by Indonesia ahead. And now for the second speaker, uh, Mrs. Agustin will talk a lot deeper about the Indonesian economy at the moment, as well as the future prospects. Please, the time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, terima kasih Pak Dekan, uh, Pak Wadek, uh, Pak Kader, dan uh, Pak Kaprodi, uh, Pak Sekprodi, dan semua jajaran uh, uh, Fakultas Ekonomi Undip yang sudah mengundang saya. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, good afternoon, James. <laughs> I hope you will enjoy Semarang with the hot situation, yeah? the hot weather. But uh, I'm sure that uh, you will enjoy uh, Semarang City, yeah? because uh, I'm glad that you like uh, lumpia. So I hope that this is not the first and the end, but uh, this is the, the first and the, the beginning. Yeah? So uh, we are uh, Faculty Economy and Business University of Diponegoro are very welcome yeah, to have a uh, further collaboration uh, with you, uh, particularly in research or any kinds of uh, activities. Yeah, Pak Dekan? <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe uh, I would like to uh, add some uh, point or some information related to the uh, James presentation, uh, especially in Indonesian economy prospects. Uh, I agree uh, with you, James, at some point. Uh, we've seen that the Indonesian economic recovery uh, is uh, getting better yeah, uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak. Why? Uh, this because uh, we see that the, compared to uh, any other countries in Asia, uh, Indonesia has, uh, yeah, really uh, high economic growth. Yeah, it's now in this first quarter, uh, the Indonesian economic growth is about uh, 5%. Uh, so, uh, what is happened is because uh, Indonesia economy expanded uh, in some uh, activities, uh, particularly in higher uh, of household consumption, and then higher fixed uh, investment and uh, higher export. Yeah? So uh, there is uh, external demand contribute to uh, GDP positively, uh, with the export uh, rising almost 16.2020%, uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, in other set, uh, import is growing, but not that really. Uh, and uh, next, please, in the fourth slide. Uh, however, uh, in uh, government spending, we still have a slow, yeah, slow uh, response in government spending. Why? This because this is the first quarter, yeah. Uh, it's kind of uh, Indonesian behavior uh, in allocate some budget, yeah, 
and uh, we see uh, compared to uh, the last uh, year we still have a higher uh, government spending in the first quarter and uh, about the indonesian uh, indonesian inflation rate we see that uh, we have a increasing uh, inflation rate why this because some uh, some uh, event yeah uh, for example because we have a ukraine russia effect yeah, war yeah and then uh, we also have a impact on uh, ramadan uh, ramadan and eid mubarak so uh, people in indonesia when we we have a uh, ramadan uh, fasting or we prepare eid mubarak so they uh, tend to uh, consume more so it it will uh, increase the demand of uh, some good so it will be uh, rise uh, i think the price will be rise rising and then uh due to the fried oil uh, price the, there is a uh, higher uh, oil uh, fried oil price this because we have uh, some problem yeah in domestic market uh, why it is Uh, relate, it relates to the DMO. DMO is a uh, domestic uh, management obligation, yeah, a market obligation. So uh, it should be, it should be uh, people in the in the the player should should ob obey the regulation, but uh, some of them they don't uh, obey the the regulation. So uh, the the fat oil will will be increased and then uh, we see that the indonesian indonesian forest debt also increasing uh, not only uh, in uh, public debt but also in uh, private debt so i think uh, it is uh, we have to be aware on uh, how to manage the debt So uh, I also read some papers uh, on uh, IMF website about the how to uh, manage the debt uh, and debt sustainability. So we we see that uh, how how uh, we see that uh, how to learn uh, from the other countries uh, to manage the foreign debt. And then, uh, so we, what, what can we, what can we conclude from uh, the Indonesian situation? So, uh, as we seen that uh, we have a uh, sixty, uh, almost sixty percent uh, household consumption contribute to the economic growth. So, uh, I think uh, we. We have to uh, maintain household consumption uh, to to maintain the the Indonesian economic growth. And then the second, we have to improve the quality of government spending so that it doesn't pile up in the end of the year. But also, uh, in average uh, quarter, we can uh, allocate our uh, budgeted. Um, equally and uh, the third we uh, should not rely on the consumption uh, household, household consumption uh, to speed up our economic growth but we have to uh, accelerate the investment uh, and export too so i believe that if we can uh, maintain our investment and then our uh, export and uh, our household consumption so we can uh, achieve the high economic growth and uh, the rest is is about the economic price booms 
Yeah, I think the the commodity price booms uh, generally not uh, not long. Yeah, so we have to to uh, uh, change our strategy, export strategy. Not only export the primary goods, but also we have to uh, support the in the in the in the sorry the industrialization. Uh, of value-added product, yeah. So uh, we can we can uh, we can achieve our uh, export uh, target. So we can also speed up our economic growth. And uh, we have to stabilize uh, price and output, of course, uh, because uh, if we have a uh, high inflation, so uh, maybe uh, not only uh, in the economic aspect, but also it will be it will affect uh, affect uh, in political aspect. And uh, the last but not least, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we have uh, significant increasing uh, public debt, so we need to. Uh, know how the way to manage our debt and how the way to do uh, the debt sustainability. I think uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much. So, thank you, uh, Miss. Agustin for delivering your presentations. Now, this is the time when we are taking questions and our speakers will be happy to respond to those questions. I will offer the first opportunity to those of you who attend this seminar in person. So please, anyone who wants to ask the questions, uh, raise your hand and I will give you the opportunity. Yes, uh, please, Pak Ahmad Syakir, and then Pak Deden. All right. Thank you, Alpha. My questions go to Mr. Walsh. I'm interested in uh, talking about Indonesian economy in more detail. Uh, up to now, Indonesia can avoid a banking crisis along with the effect caused by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But according to OJK, there is 8,000 trillion rupiah of loan that is restructured up to now. To my opinion, it is like a time bomb that if Indonesia cannot handle this issue, knows that we will face problems in financial or, or banking, uh, banking sectors. My question is, what Indonesia should do, because right now we can avoid the banking crisis, but there is 8,000 rupiah of loan that is restructured, what Indonesia should do so that Indonesia can avoid the time bomb to explode? That's the first, that's the first question. The second question is about uh, fiscal discipline or fiscal uh, consolidation. I do agree with you that uh, next year, Indonesia must go back to the 3% uh, ceiling. However, as we all know, that Indonesia still needs huge spending, government spending, to recover the economy, to cope, to deal with the effect of the pandemic, uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and also the banking restructurization. While at the same time, the government debt is so huge. The question is, how can Indonesia finance uh, government spending next year, while the fiscal consolidation is, to my opinion, is a protracted 
yes, of course we know that Indonesia has uh, improved the taxation, as you mentioned in your presentation, that we uh, expand the uh, income tax uh, bracket, and then uh, we integrate the NEK, that citizen uh, number, with the NPWP, or a tax file, file number. This is good as a concept, but I think uh, the result is not uh, happening in the short term. So what should Indonesia do next year? Well, we have to go back to the 3% on ceiling. The last question was about uh, IMF role. I think Indonesian people keep memorizing well the epic event in 1998 when Michael Kamdeshu folded his hand behind the President Suharto and President Suharto bowed uh, signing uh, the letter of intent. Uh, we still not forgetting this, this event and I think Indonesian people still remember that and have uh, and associated uh, IMF with this kind of rule. But you mentioned in the first uh, your presentation that there are three rules of IMF uh, the capacity development and then the uh, policy uh, suggestion and then the, the second one is uh, giving, giving loan. And I think IMF is not giving loan anymore to Indonesia because Indonesia does not experience, does not have uh, international liquidity mismatch right now. Uh, however, what people associate with IMF is IMF give loan to Indonesia. The question is what IMF has been doing since 1998 is very critical for Indonesian people. Not only for uh, Ministry of Finance, not only for uh, Indonesian government official, not only for um, uh, the central bank, but I think IMF should uh, go down to the earth, go down to the regions to uh, publicly uh, declare that IMF does not give loan to, to Indonesia anymore. What IMF is doing is capacity development. What IMF is doing is now is uh, a policy policy suggestion. I think it is it is uh, important for IMF to do so that uh, people's uh, memory about bad memory about what happened in 1998 uh, can, could be could be restored and recovered. I think uh, that's uh, my three questions. Thank you, Alpha. I think James, you can directly answer the questions. We have three questions. The first is about possibility of banking crisis. The second is about fiscal consolidations, understanding that uh, huge government spending is still necessary for their recovery. And number three, if we're not get over the idea of what happened in 1998. So I'll do the easy ones first. Uh, on the restructured debt, I have the same concern that you do, that, it, that there's a potential time bomb there of loans to companies that may never come back, and there would have to be potentially large write-offs. So I talked to, a few months ago, ratings agencies that look at the banks individually, and to OJK and to some of the banks themselves, and it, you, 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 ne you never know, as, you know, as, uh, I can't remember his name. Warren Buffett once said, you never know who is, bathing, who, who is in the ocean naked until the tide goes out. So we don't know how large the losses are going to be. But there does seem to be uh, this understanding that most of the banks have, have taken this pretty seriously and are doing what they can to make sure that the loans are being extended only to companies that will be able to pay them back. In any country, risk management isn't perfect, and they will have to write off some of these loans. So if you look at how large their provisions are at, each of, at the major banks and how large the restructured loans are, most of them have enough provisions to tolerate a pretty large percentage of these restructured loans going into default. It's unlikely that the, well, so I think the capital, so first of all, I think the provisions are strong enough that 
the large banks should be okay because it won't be 100% of these loans. You know, there will be some loans that are fine. That's, so that would be my first point, that for, the banks are holding provisions against future NPLs, and those will be able to absorb a lot of potential losses. The second thing is the bank's capital positions are actually quite strong in Indonesia. So even if they run out of provisions, there still is an additional cushion from their high levels of capital, and they should be able to accommodate uh, even greater losses. So those are the two points on the bright side that make me think that they will probably get through this okay. The third point, which is the hardest of all to verify, is to how I do wonder how loans to a lot of public companies are being treated because it's difficult for banks to – in any country. I worked on China before this, and this is a – and India. In both countries, it's very, very difficult to deal with loans owed to public companies, and that's also true here. Uh, in, in the, the, how governments – reimburse public companies for overdue loans is problematic. It takes a long time. It's not always clear what loans are guaranteed. So I do think it's possible that there are large outstanding loans to public sector companies, and the public sector companies may not have enough revenue to pay those loans back after, May, after March 2023. I, I think it's unlikely that would cause – so that is a possibility, that there will be loans that they should write off but will not write off because they're owed to public companies. And they will say public companies have a guarantee, so they won't write it off. If that happens, I think it's unlikely you would see a banking crisis immediately. What you would see instead is that the money coming into the banks and their liquidity position would weaken. So if that, that, that to me is, the, is, the, is the, likeliest neg the, the likeliest outcome, in my view, is that the banks are able to continue going and things are fine. The second, but the downside scenario that I would see is that these loans to public sector companies are weak and there's not enough cash coming into the banks to strengthen their own capital and to allow them to continue lending. I don't think that's going to be the baseline, but it is certainly a possibility. And it, that kind of lending to zombie companies or evergreening loans to public, public companies is very difficult for supervisors to, to follow. And the OJK is, like every other supervisor, it's hard to know when this is going on. So I do think that's a risk, but overall, they do have a lot of provisions, and they do have very strong capital positions. So I, I think that they, that we, it's very unlikely there would be a banking crisis. Um, the second thing on fiscal consolidation, uh, you know, when I, talk to the when I talk to some people about the poverty rate in Indonesia, and they mentioned that it had risen in 2020 and then fallen again in the last two years, or they expect it to fall this year, to me, that means that the government is doing something right about how they're helping low-income people. And I think that's probably the PEN program. And I think it would be worthwhile for the government or for academics to look into how successful has the PEN been at reducing poverty and protecting vulnerable households. Because if you've been able to reduce, poverty is still a little bit higher than it was before the pandemic, but not very much higher. And considering that a lot of low-income households especially in tourist-oriented areas or people who were, you know, informal employees, like guys who were selling food from Akaki Lima, that they had all of their income taken away for two years. That's a, a large segment of the population, but somehow uh, poverty hasn't really risen. That means to me that there really are social programs that are quite effective and that should probably be continued or expanded. So I agree that there's really important needs here. And infrastructure is another area where we would have to – it would be good to increase spending overall. So there's only two ways to uh, finance government spending responsibly, taxing and borrowing. So the tax harmonization law was a good step toward increasing the amount of resources available to the government. Uh, there's another increase in the VAT rate that's scheduled, I think, for 2025. That would provide more resources that can be applied toward uh, development goals. And there can also be improvements in uh, tax administration. Uh, Indonesia's tax-to-GDP ratio is very low compared to a lot of other countries at this income level. And it's, always, it's very difficult to improve tax administration over the short run. But over the long run, the more efficiently you collect taxes, the more revenue you'll collect, and the more you'll be able to spend on these goals. So that's what I would say should be done. You know, continued improvement of the tax system and ensuring that the the second VAT increase goes through, those would be very helpful in generating the resources that are necessary to achieve those goals. Uh, on the third question, the IMF in 1998, uh, the former head of the Asia-Pacific Department, so my boss, 
uh, is now the, he's not my boss anymore because now he's the president of the Central Bank of Korea, uh, Ri Chang Yong. And when I got this job, he said, the most difficult part of your job will be talking about 1998 and rebuilding, and rebuilding trust between Indonesia and the IMF. So it, I'm surprised how infrequently it comes up. Uh, and I guess that's good because it's uncomfortable to talk about. But it's, I, I would say that the IMF at that time, in the late 90s, we had a, a, a number of programs that were designed in a way that really alienated a lot of people. And I started at the fund a few years after that. And one of the first projects I worked on was trying to rethink how the IMF handles lending programs to try to make sure that they're more consistent with government's policy goals and development goals. So we have the criticism of the fund back after the Indonesia program and the Argentina program that uh, was imposed a few years later was very strong, and the institution definitely heard it uh, back then. So there have been changes to how the fund handles things since then. Uh, we don't lend nearly as much money to low-income countries as we used to. So Indonesia was never in that, it hasn't been in that category in generations, but we used to have very large outstanding loans to a lot of low-income countries in Africa and also to places like Laos and Nepal. We don't provide loans like that anymore. We have small loans that are intended to signal our views on economic management, and we, we aren't in the business of providing large loans to poor countries anymore. And with middle-income countries, the stigma that you talk about is still there in a lot of places. I mean, everywhere, basically. And one thing that the fund has tried to do is to try to focus on capacity development and try to focus on policy advice as a way to see, uh, as my, as Chang Yong used to say, he, we, the IMF wants to be seen as a trusted family doctor. If you have a problem, you can go to the doctor and ask them about it, and the doctor will provide advice. That's how he saw our job in Asia, and I think that's a good way to look at it. But, you know, we... We, we, uh, that's really how we try to do things. I would be very happy to go on the ground and talk about this with people. Uh, but uh, because of COVID, it was challenging for a little while. So we're only starting now. But it is, uh, th that history is there. And it's something that uh, the IMF has to be aware of and remember that people here will, will still think about that. So I, I'm, it's, it's an important thing that we have to take into account and make sure that we're listening as much as we're talking, I think. Thank you for the answers. Uh, in the meantime, I will also ask the virtual audience who wants to ask the questions, please raise your hands while I'm taking questions from Padedin. Please, Padedin. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wang, for a very informative and also insightful presentation. Um, my question is simple, actually, relating with our topic, the role of multilateral institution in economic revival. Uh, my question will be, uh, do you think that the role of the multilateral institution, such as the fund, will be endangered by growing bilateral agreement between countries? For example, uh, one country reject the loan uh, offered by the fund, and they choose instead to propose uh, the loan to China, for example. So that would be my question. Thank you. There's a number of real threats to the to multilateral organizations right now. Uh, I think the, the biggest one is clearly what's going on uh, with the situation in Ukraine, and this, I you know this the way that that's been handled has put a real strain on the idea that the whole globe can act together on things. That that is a real concern in the long run for how any international organization is able to operate, and we're very concerned about that. We have a, you know, our membership is almost universal. The only large countries in the world that aren't in the IMF are Cuba and North Korea, which probably don't want to join, and the Americans would stop them anyway. But, uh, <coughs> you know, we, we are a forum for everybody, and we want to be able to discuss problems with everybody. And one of the topics that we discuss is, uh, what we, uh, is how debt to low-income countries is handled. And you need to be able to bring everybody to the table to talk about these things. And we need to be able to make sure that everybody's views are heard on it. So it's true that uh, 
when the IMF and the World Bank and the regional development banks like the African Development Bank began to provide less uh, lending to a lot of countries in Africa in particular, but low-income countries in general. Uh, private markets stepped in, and a lot of, uh, I will just say, bilateral creditors stepped in. So in the past, uh, it was very difficult in the 70s and 80s to figure out what to do about these very high debt burdens in developing countries. And what the global community came up with was what was called the, initiative, the HIPIC initiative for high, highly indebted poor countries. So as part of that initiative, uh, the World Bank, the IMF, most of the multilateral banks, and then a group of countries called the Paris Club, which was most of the rich countries, got together and they agreed that if countries improved their economic management, that all, everybody would write off uh, their debts. So what the fund and the bank would like to do this time around is something similar, but it's much harder to restructure, to get everybody in the room with the, uh, we're calling it the combined framework, and that's, it's much harder to get everybody around the table now because private investors don't have the same pressure from uh, NGOs or from governments to try to restructure these debts, and some bilateral creditors will have there could be loans to public companies that aren't necessarily sovereign loans, and there have been real challenges in how to classify some of this new debt that countries have. So it's, it, it seems like it's a very difficult process for dealing with all of these debts, and that it's something that is threatening the multilateral process. But the fact is, the multilateral process is the only real option for handling these things in a way that is consistent with everybody's interests. If you do this on a bilateral on a bilateral basis, then only the debtor and the creditor are involved. And in that case, the debtor probably gets a worse deal than if you have the global community talking about how to handle this. So it is a challenge, but there was also a challenge when we were trying to deal with the first round of low-income countries with very high debt burdens back in the 80s and 90s, as I said. And the global community was able to figure out a way around it. So I would hope that as long as we still continue to have forums like the IMF and the G20, that we'll be able to talk about things like this issue with debt owed to low-income countries, and uh, we can resolve these problems again. Thank you for the answers. And now we have a question for our virtual audience. Please, Pa Yozi, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you to Alpha. Can you hear my voice, Alpha? Yes, we do, but you can speak a bit louder. That will be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Ilya Rahman from Economics Connect. So I have three questions. Two uh, Mr. Wolf and one to, to Esther. Okay, the first one, it's about, uh, we have the policy, the Bank Indonesia and your government to provide more funding to, to tackle this about this pandemic. This policy is name of burden sharing. Okay. Uh, our uh, central bank buy some uh, obligation from the government, and the IMF warning about this policy. And I want to know about the reason of the IMF is the warning about that uh, burden sharing policy. Maybe it's about of the independency struck, disturbed independency of the central bank, or maybe IMF warning about maybe this <coughs> from central banks it uh, give to BE to more printing money. I want to know about the IMF reasons, how 
uh, what or what reason uh, IMF warning about this burden sharing policy. Is it clear, Bu Alpha? I'm sorry, sir. We have some technical difficulties here, and your question your question is not clear enough. Can you just repeat again, sir? I'm really sorry for that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the first question is about the burden sharing. Burden sharing between Bank Indonesia and our government to provide more funding to finance uh, the many program to tackling this uh, effect of the our pandemic. So. The IMF warning about this policy, and I want to know what the reason of the IMF warning of this policy, burden sharing between BI and uh, our government. So, what the reason? Maybe it's about uh, disturb independency of our central bank, of the role of central bank, or about maybe IMF worry about this program lead maybe to print, more printing of the money, and maybe it leads to the greater uh, inflation. Yes, okay, so basically you want to know the reason as to why IMF feel worried about the burden sharing policies between Bank Indonesia and the government. Okay. And okay. the second one okay. is about uh, we know that in Sri Lanka, okay, the case in Sri Lanka warning us, so maybe IMF have uh, several strategies or several programs to be to recommendation to our government to avoid about this case. Sri Lanka is categories uh, in the death trap. So maybe what uh, we should do to, to avoid of this, uh, this about, about this case, yeah, we we can. Uh, boy from the trap. Okay. okay. And your last question, you said you have three. Okay, for Buestram. Okay, uh, I have a question, maybe from your point of view, because you are the academician and also the economist. Um, what the is the rule of the many multilateral institutions like the IMF, like the World Bank, maybe WTO, uh, will be lead to uh, impact for our uh, independence or not? Maybe I think they will really happy us, but yeah, maybe. Very maybe the receipt is not uh, appropriate for, for our condition, maybe. Uh, so I want to know to Bu Esther as like the economist, what 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 your final view about the uh, about the role of the many of multilateral we will give to partnership to Elisha and how that impact to our economy. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much for your questions, sir. So basically in these questions, we have three questions. The first one is related to what IMF thinks about the burden sharing policy between Bank Indonesia and, and the government. And also the second question is related to what happens in Sri Lanka and what is the policy recommendation from the IMF to avoid that situation. And those questions are for you, James. The third one is for Baeza, but it's related to 
how is the multilateral institutions will affect the independency of the country? That, that would be the third question. Uh, you can also answer that if you'd like to. Okay. Uh, so on, on burden sharing, the concern with uh, – so the, the issue is that the central bank is buying debt on the primary market. And this is an issue where the, the fund used to be very orthodox about this and say that central bank financing of government deficits will almost always lead to high inflation. But the Japanese central bank has been buying government debt for 20 years now, and the central banks in the U.S. and Europe have now been doing it for more than 10 years, and at least until recently, inflation wasn't out of control in any of these places. So it's very hard to say that the optimal amount of central bank purchases of government debt in a country like Indonesia is zero. If uh, the Japanese can and the Americans can get away with, you know, trillions of uh, yen and uh, dollars worth of central bank financing, it does seem like there should be some space for the Indonesian central bank to do primary market purchases without destabilizing the economy. The problem comes up is that we, we don't know how much is too much. So at some point, the amount the, – the issue is that every time the central bank buys government debt, it's injecting more money into the economy. And the, so far, in places like the U.S. and Japan, that hasn't – that doesn't really seem to have led to higher inflation. That may now be ending, but certainly for a long time. It didn't seem like these additional, this additional liquidity creation had led to more and more inflation. In Indonesia, we also don't know if it will or not. But what we can say about it is that it makes it more complicated for the central bank to raise interest rates because all of this liquidity that's created in Indonesia, uh, a lot of it winds up uh, getting it, – it winds up sitting on banks' balance sheets and expanding the amount of uh, liquid assets that they have and that they're able to lend out. So the central bank is currently trying to reduce that overhang of liquidity because they may have to raise interest rates, and this is an important first step toward doing that. But every time the government buys another bond, then it undoes a little bit of that reserve requirement increase and makes it a little harder to raise interest rates in the future. So if these purchases go on for a long time, it eventually becomes harder and harder for the central bank to be able to deal with inflation. And for a long time in the U.S. and Japan, it didn't seem like that was an issue. But it is now beginning to complicate monetary policy in the U.S. There has been so much liquidity creation in the U.S. that when the Fed began to raise interest rates, it actually has to pay uh, banks reserves because the banks have gotten so much liquidity created by the Fed that they're sitting on that they are parking it at the central bank, and the central bank has to pay interest on it. And that interest rate is no longer zero. So in Indonesia, the interest rate now is three and a half is, is well, it's close to three and a half percent, and as rates rise, it will rise with it. So the concern we have is that the more of this liquidity that is created through central bank purchases, the harder it will become to control inflation if inflation begins to take off. There's just it just means that there's too much liquidity in the system. So at the moment, it doesn't seem like this is a problem, and the purchases probably were one of the main reasons why Indonesia was so stable throughout the pandemic. So overall, this was a very successful program, but it has to be unwound at some point because eventually it will run the risk of making it hard for the central bank to engage in monetary policy. Uh, the second one was how to avoid the Sri Lanka debt trap. Uh, Sri Lanka is an extreme case, and there has been quite a long period of uh, challenging economic management issues and complicated debt contracts. Some of it is related to uh, Chinese contracts that have been difficult to address according to the frameworks that the fund is normally used to dealing with. So Indonesia has had a very responsible fiscal policy for a long time. It doesn't have a lot of these complicated bilateral uh, debt issues that Sri Lanka has had. I, I don't think it's a Sri Lanka is an extreme case, and I think Indonesia is very far from that. I, I was actually in Sri Lanka in February, and it really struck me how much Chinese investment there is there, because there's just a lot of borrowing from China and a lot of Chinese investment. And it really hit me that in Indonesia, you very rarely see any evidence of Chinese investment. There's this, we, just, we just don't borrow as much money from Chinese banks or Chinese infrastructure companies as a lot of other countries do, and Sri Lanka does. So. 
uh, even the, the building sites around some of the new buildings in Sri Lanka, they look exactly like the building sites that you see in Chinese cities. They have the same kind of fences and dorms that you see around every Chinese city. So what's happened in Sri Lanka is a very unusual, well, it's a, so far it's unusual. There's going to be debt distress in a lot of places after the pandemic, and Sri Lanka is just one of the first. But it's, a, it's, it's in a very different position from Indonesia with far more bilateral debt and far more challenging debt. Indonesia has a more sophisticated financial system and a much more sustainable debt position. I, I, don't, think it's, I don't think it's something to worry about. Uh, and then the role of multilaterals in So I can, in, a, in Indonesia's case, you know, we, in the three areas where we are involved, we, um, uh, you know, we provide capacity development and we provide policy advice. So in all of these cases, we're really just suggesting things. And I, I, don't, I don't think there's any concern about sovereignty. You know, if we publish a report on, uh, on any country, we will be positive about some aspects of policy, we'll be negative about other aspects of policy. and. You know, that's okay. It, it, it happens. Um, if you read the staff reports on the United States, for example, uh, they are often quite critical of income inequality in the U.S., uh, the fact that the American tax system is very antiquated and very old-fashioned, perhaps like our public transportation, and, 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 and the social programs in the U.S. are often poorly designed and not sufficiently inclusive. So the IMF writes about that every year. And people in the U.S. get annoyed by it. But uh, the U.S., like Indonesia, is a big open democracy. And people discuss these issues in public. And that's how policy is made. So the IMF, to the extent where we talk about countries' economic policies, what we want to do is be a voice that people respect and listen to in a broader policy debate. And we're just one voice among many. And that's, that's, the, mo that's the most we can do in a place like Indonesia or the U.S. is just be part of this discussion. It is a little touchier, I agree, when you talk about lending. I, I've worked on low-income countries, and there's always this tension where countries only come to us for borrowing if the situation is difficult. So Sri Lanka, for example. And then we, you, know, you, you don't come to the IMF if you can sell bonds at an auction, like Indonesia does every two weeks. You only come to us when no one's showing up at the auctions anymore. So it's always a difficult situation. We do try to make sure that our lending programs are consistent with developmental goals and that they're consistent with economic stability and growth. Uh, that can be hard. Uh, sometimes we, we can be overly optimistic about the growth options for a country, and because of that, the deficit remains large and social programs may suffer. Uh, we try to avoid that, but it can be difficult. But the way we try to think about lending operations is that governments are already in a difficult position. We're just trying to help out and also to make sure to our shareholders that we will get that money paid back someday. But, uh, you know, you can always say it's, – it's, it's, I don't want to say when a country is in a difficult position, they have the right to say no to borrowing from us. But, you know, the, the Cubans don't borrow from us. So uh, it's it, – it, I, I recognize that there, there will always be this perceived tension. but. Uh, we try to design our programs in a way that means that the, the strategy that's used for developmental goals comes from inside the country and that we're only trying to help bring countries back to stability so that long-term growth can be brought back. Uh, thank you for the response. But I think Mbaisa will also respond regarding the Indonesian independence or countries' independence when they deal with multilateral institutions. And, and if you disagree, that's fine. Thank you, Alpha. Uh, who is uh, the pa, pa Yossi. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Yossi, for the very interesting uh, question. Yeah, uh, I think we have to be smart. Yeah, we have to be smart. Uh, we can we can accept or we can refuse. Not all, uh, not all list of policy recommendation we can accept. Yeah, it, it depends on how much impact uh, uh, the the policy on our uh, Indonesian economy. For example, in the case of fresh milk, yeah, 
because uh, I actually has a re had a research about fresh milk, and uh, because uh, the Indonesian government at the time uh, accept uh, the policy about uh, the trading, the global trading in uh, fresh milk, and then uh, it it impact on uh, farmer. So when uh, when the negative impact uh, rise up uh, in the in uh, farmer, uh, so I think uh, uh, the Indonesian government, uh, particularly uh, Kementerian Pertanian, they uh, try to uh, change the policy. Uh, they uh, try to discuss uh, at the w uh, WTO, but uh, they they are lost lost yeah because uh, when we want to uh, uh, increase uh, the the allocation uh, for fresh milk in um, uh, for the farmer for the local farmer. They, uh, they, uh, some some countries, uh, for example, Australia, and then uh, uh, I forget. Uh, they they uh, they don't want uh, it happens. They dispute uh, and Indonesian laws. So uh, I believe uh, the Indonesian government now. Uh, uh, it's smarter, yeah, because when uh, I have a research, uh, international research collaboration, and um, of course uh, the policy recommendation goes to the Indonesian government, but uh, the the proportion uh, between local researcher and international or foreign uh, researcher uh, must be equal, yeah. So. Uh, from uh, the propos uh, from the composition of uh, researcher, we see that uh, uh, we can we can uh, we can propose our uh, what we want. So uh, I, I believe that uh, now the Indonesian government. Uh, can uh, not not only saying agree, yeah, agree, yes, 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 man, but uh, uh, the Indonesian government uh, sometimes uh, can refuse, and uh, I I think uh, not not um, not uh, we can we can still have a benefit uh, from the multi multilateral. Institution, uh, for example, G20, yeah, and then uh, uh, WTO or World Bank, IMF, uh, as uh, as we see that uh, there is a beneficial, so we can accept the policy recommendation. If uh, we don't see the benefit for for us, so please refuse, or we can have a open discuss about it, yeah. I think they are very welcome to uh, have open discussion. Yeah, yes. So, uh, basically, good of you agree that we shouldn't take benefits from the multinational institutions, and IMF just give recommendations, and we can always say yes or no according to our own interests. So, basically, we have a very lively discussion today. Uh, unfortunately, the time doesn't allow us to continue. So once again, I want to say thank you for Mr. James Walsh for delivering the presentations and the discussion, as well as to Mrs. Augustine as well. Please pick a round of applause to both of them. Yes. And I also want to say thank you to all the participants in person here, as well as virtual, for participating in this seminar. And now I close the sessions and I will get it back to the MC. Thank you. Hadirin yang kami muliakan, telah kita simak bersama penyampaian materi seminar nasional dengan judul The Role of Multilateral Institution 
in economic revival. Terima kasih. Kami ucapkan kepada Mr. James Walsh, BA, PhD, Ibu Esther Triastuti, SA, MSA, PhD, Dr. Fer Paul Alfafarah, SA, MSC, atas ilmu dan wawasan baru yang telah disampaikan. Prospective audience, this was the national seminar entitled The Role of Multilateral Institutions in Economic Revival. Thank you very much for the enlightening speeches to Mr. James Walsh, PA, PhD, Mrs. Esther Sri Astuti, PhD, and Dr. Rer Paul Alfafarah, MSC. Sebagai ungkapan terima kasih berkenan Dekan Fakultas Ekonomika dan Bisnis Universitas Diponegoro untuk menyerahkan cindera mata kepada pembicara, pendiskusi, dan moderator. Kami silakan Profesor Dr. Suharnomo S.A. M.S.I., Mr. James Walsh, P.A. Ph.D., Ibu Esther Sri Astuti, Ph.D., dan Ibu Dr. Rer Paul Alfafarah, M.S.I. untuk menempatkan diri. Dilanjutkan dengan foto bersama. May we have the photo session? Hadirin, kami silakan untuk kembali ke tempat duduk. Thank you very much. You may cordially take your seat.
Hadirin yang kami muliakan, seluruh rangkaian acara telah kita lalui. Tibalah kita di penghujung acara. Terima kasih berkenan mengikuti kegiatan ini hingga akhir. Kami pamit undur diri. Mohon maaf atas segala hal yang kurang berkenan di hati dalam penyelenggaraan kegiatan ini. Well, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have had a productive and inspiring time together, and we now come to the end of the event. On behalf of the host and the committee, we do apologize for any mistakes in presenting this event. Thank you so much for amazing enthusiasm and participation. Kami silakan kepada Bapak Ibu hadirin dan tamu undangan untuk meninggalkan ruang acara dan ruang Zoom meeting. Sekali lagi kami ucapkan terima kasih dan selamat sore. For all audience, you are you are allowed to leave the room and also the Zoom meeting room. Once again, thank you and good afternoon.
Sometimes we're not ourselves There's no one I can turn to 